So, this week, <coughs> excellent, um, the overlooked women of the Bible, and as I said, I want to think about Mary. Now, sometimes Google is your friend, but sometimes there are things you just shouldn't bother Googling. Right? Some of the pictures of Mary are totally bizarre. I'm fairly confident she's not blonde-haired and blue-eyed. I'm fairly confident she didn't float on a cloud either, uh, and probably still isn't. And why you would want her on your sweatshirt is beyond me. However, all of those things are there. Often misunderstood, Mary was one of the main characters in the story of Jesus. She has two different roles traditionally in um, Catholicism and uh, Protestantism. From my perspective, it seems to me that, that lots of Catholics uh, overestimate the role of Mary. According to uh, Catholic teaching, uh, Pope Pius IX said, God has committed to Mary the treasury of all good things in order that through her are obtained every hope, every grace, and all salvation. Pius uh, Twelfth said, it's the will of God that we should have nothing which has not passed through the hands of Mary. Then there was a push in the uh, 1990s among some uh, Catholic theologians for the Pope to declare Mary the co-redeemer, mediator of all graces and advocate for the people of God. And before uh, I go on, I want to be very clear. I'm not here today to bash Catholics. There are very many Catholic uh, folk who have a deep, deep uh, love of Jesus, a really profound faith, such that I would like to have. However, I want to put it to you that Mary has no place in redemption or salvation. It's only the shed blood of Jesus that brings forgiveness of sin and access to God the Father. Mary is not a co-redemptorist or a mediator. She had to have her sins forgiven just like everybody else. And so we have to be really careful not to give to Mary those things that belong only to Jesus. However, if some uh, overestimate, many of us underestimate. Sometimes we simply attribute things to her that are not taught in the Bible. Many of us allow her a cameo appearance in Christmas cards and Christmas carols and nativity scenes, and then we tuck her away in a box until next year when we take her out again and, and forget uh, for the rest of the year. Mary is often the victim of simple neglect, having been abandoned in some kind of evangelical limbo. And some of us have consigned her to virtual oblivion. But as we'll see this morning, Mary played this crucial role in the plan of God to save humanity. And if we ignore that, then we are impoverished by doing so. And so my goal this morning is not to bash Catholics or Protestants. So if you're itching for that kind of theological gunfight hard lines, uh, that's not why we're here. You'll get enough of that with the football today. Uh, my, my goal is simply to try and answer this question based on what the Bible teaches us. What relevance does Mary and her faith have to us today? Mary was not wealthy. She was probably not well educated. She might even have been illiterate. She was unknown outside of her hometown during most of her lifetime. And yet she had something about her that, that, draw, that drew her uh, to God and him to her. There was something in her, an inner beauty. And that was so powerful that she was chosen. Of all people, she was the one who was chosen to be the mother of Jesus, God's own son. First Samuel 16, 
and 7 says this. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. This is when Samuel has been sent to, to anoint a new king. And all the, all the big, tall, handsome, strapping brothers came, and they were all rejected because God had chosen David. Why? Because we're told he was a man after God's own heart. The Lord said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. What was it that made Mary stand out? It was her heart and how it responded in faith and obedience to God. God's favor rests on those who respond in faith. When the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, I, I, I do quite like these stories because every time, or most of the times you see an angel appears, they then have to go, don't be afraid. Hmm? You know, <laughs> just like, oh, don't, no, no, don't be afraid. I suspect I would probably do that myself. But he, he told Mary that she was highly favored, highly favored. Another translation puts it, she was God's favored one. She was favored not just because of something she was about to do in becoming the mother of Jesus, but she was favored because of what she had already done. She had already lived a life of faith. She had already shown that she could be trusted. She had already developed a relationship with God. She had proven herself to be faithful, and so God was able to use her. God's favor came to Mary even though she came from a modest, if not poor, family. God chose to use her, even though she grew up in the middle of nowhere, in this um, you know, way out region in the world, in this tiny village called Nazareth, where there was only a, a few hundred people. God favored Mary because of the inner beauty of her faith and her obedience to his word. God's favor is on those who exhibit faith and obedience. It doesn't matter how old you are whether you're a child, a teen, or older. Mary was in her teens. Abraham was around 80 when God called him. So there's time for some of you yet. Hmm? Now, don't be laughing. <laughs> you just never know. It doesn't matter how old you are. God wants to use all of his children to further his plans and build his kingdom. It doesn't matter where you come from. You might come from the country or the city or the suburbs. It doesn't matter how clever you are or what your family life is like. It doesn't matter how much money you have. God looks at your heart. It's what's in your heart and where your heart is with him that's important. We talk a lot about faith in the church, but what is faith? Well, faith is partly believing that what God says is true. If God says it, it's true. After the angel visited, I, I have to say, I really like this picture. This is Mary and Elizabeth. And, and there's something just joyous about the whole thing. Uh, uh, you know, and, and when you read the story and, and they go and, and Mary comes and Elizabeth says, my own child leapt when he arrived. You know, there's something just amazing about that, and I, I really like that, uh, that picture of these two women, both of whom are being used by God because of their faith, and used in different ways and at very different stages in life. One of them had to exercise faith because she was young. The other had to exercise faith because she was too old to have children. Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was pregnant with John the Baptist. And Elizabeth's response is, blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. That's faith. Faith is believing that what the Lord has said will be accomplished or that the Lord will do what he said he'll do. We have to remember that the angel Gabriel told Mary something that was totally impossible. First, that she would have a son who would be named Jesus. Well, actually, the truth is, she could have gone um, and had sex with Joseph and maybe had a son and they might have called him Jesus. That, that is possible. But actually, what is impossible is that 
this child she's going to have is going to be the son of God. How, how is it possible for this human girl to have a child that is divine? I, d- I do not understand. I don't profess to understand. But I believe that, that that's what happened here. Mary's not had sex with Joseph or any other man. And so how could she possibly be having this, this child? I also quite like that picture because Gabriel's response is nothing is impossible to God nothing is impossible for God so for those of you who are struggling with an issue whatever it is and you don't see any human way beyond it Maybe it's a health thing that's just become part of your life and, and, and you don't know how to deal with it or what's going on. Nothing is impossible for God. If you're struggling with doubt or, or if you're struggling with all sorts of other stuff, if you go to God and, and trust him that he'll, he'll be with you, that he'll answer your need. And remember, nothing is impossible God. Gabriel says the Holy Spirit would come upon her and the power of the Most High would overshadow her. Not a lot of detail there, but you get the gist. She's having a baby. With God, nothing is impossible. And so she has to put her faith into action. She believed what the angel said. She believed that, that this was going to come true because God had said it. So, so she, her response is, I am the Lord's servant and may it be to me as you've said. God told Mary he was uh, going to do the impossible and Mary believed. She had faith. She trusted that God would make her uh, conceive this child even before she saw the evidence of her uh, pregnancy. The author of the book of Hebrews has a bit to say about faith as well. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says, What is faith? It's the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It's not wishy-washy, airy-fairy, I I hope it will not rain tomorrow when the thunderstorm is forecast. It's a confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It's the evidence of things that we cannot yet see. And isn't this next bit good? God gave his approval to people in days of old because of their faith. God's favor is with those who live in faith. Are you living in faith? Because if you are, God's favor rests with you. Hebrews eleven six, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God gave his favor or approval to those who had faith. People like Mary, who were sure and certain of God's promise, even if they didn't see it. Notice it says it's impossible to please God without faith. And God continues to give his favor to those who have faith and trust in him and his promises today. Promises like this, Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, and who've been called according to his purpose. Do you believe that even now God is working everything for your good? Those things that that give you hassle, those things that you struggle with, those things that you think are too much, even in those, God is working for your good. John 3, 16, for God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that he loves you enough to have sent Jesus to die for you? You know, sometimes one of the ways the devil gets us is to think about how many things we do that we shouldn't do. And then we begin to wonder, how could God love us? How could God love me? 
if he knew what I was like, if he knew, what, well, of course he does. Of course he does. But he still loves us. Romans 10 and 9, and this is what we've been doing this week. Asking people to confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. It's not, it's not you might be. It's not, oh, 10 years down the line when you've learned enough. It's not that. It's when you confess and you believe you are saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and that one day you will rise to be with him in glory? Romans 3, 24 and 25. Yet now in his gracious kindness, God declares us not guilty. He has done this through Christ Jesus who has freed us by taking away our sins. For God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to satisfy God's anger against us. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed his blood, sacrificing his life for us. Do you believe that God has forgiven you through Jesus' death on the cross? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We must believe what God has said if we're to receive his promises. So faith is about believing, but it's also a active. Mary was willing to endure many things to be a servant. But faith is more than believing something to be true with my mind. Faith must also impact how we live our lives. My actions should reflect what I believe. Faith is active. I, I should do things differently and behave differently because I believe that what God has said is true. I, I can believe that people have walked on the moon despite all the conspiracy theories. I can believe that George Washington was, in fact, the first president of the United States of America because it's true. But, but that kind of knowledge and belief doesn't change my life. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't trouble me uh, particularly. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes I treat my faith in God in the same way. I, I know it in my head, but I don't really let it bother me too much. I don't really let it affect me too much. I don't really change my lifestyle because it's only in my head. It hasn't quite reached my heart. And it's not really making a difference to the way I behave. To believe something is true in your head and to act as though it's true are two different things. And yet faith needs both of those. When the angel Gabriel told Mary she would miraculously bear a child from the Holy Spirit, not only did she believe it would happen, but she adjusted her life in line with God's plan. She responded with a willingness to do whatever God wanted her to do. And so she accepted this immense responsibility of bearing this Christ child and raising him in God's way. Her response was, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be as you have said. She didn't just believe the impossible would happen. She was willing to be a vessel used by God to accomplish his plan. Now think about what she was signing up to. She was trusting that her soon-to-be husband would believe the story that the angel had arrived, would believe that she hadn't been sleeping around, that it was really God's child, would, would not throw her out. She was trusting that he wouldn't seek a divorce, forcing her to raise the child on her own. She was willing to be the gossip of the town because she was pregnant before they were properly married. Either she would have been ridiculed for being with Joseph in their betrothal period, or if she was divorced, she would be compared to a prostitute. And everybody in Nazareth would know and they would all be talking about it. No matter what uh, way you look at it, it was going to be hard for Mary. But, but she had faith in God that his plan was right, and she was willing to go through with it. And then look what comes later. A long journey to Bethlehem, where Jesus was born in squalor. Visits from shepherds, blessings from Anna and Simeon at the temple, wise men bringing really weird gifts for a baby. There was no baby grower or at all. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What's that about? Becoming a refugee in Egypt. Losing Jesus only to find him in the temple. His public ministry and teaching where at times his family thought that he was mad. His arrest and crucifixion. How must she have felt 
standing at the cross. You know, her life wasn't going to be easy. It was full of challenges, things that could and should probably have shaken her faith. But then imagine when she fe- what she felt when she saw the resurrected Jesus and realized that the promise was fulfilled. That what the angel had said was true. What kind of faith is it? If I believe in God, I believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. I believe that Jesus spoke the truth, that he died, that he rose from the dead so that I can be forgiven. And what if I believe that God has promises of abundant life and eternal life, but then I go on living as if actually it makes no difference. If I claim to have faith in God and it makes no difference to how I live, it's not faith. Faith implies a willingness to follow God and to live in a way that honors him. Faith is more than believing in our head. Faith involves our actions. And so will we, like Mary, live our life differently because of what we believe? Will I change my priorities to bring them in line with God's priorities? Am I willing to allow God to change my character to become more like his? Will I prioritize my time and money in the way that God wants me to? Well, I love God and others by treating those around me like Jesus would. Being a willing servant might mean sacrifice. Jesus' brother James writes in his letter in James chapter 2. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Our faith should affect our head, our heart, and our hands, and our wallets. Our head what we believe about God, about Jesus, our heart, so that we have compassion for others. We should love others, including our enemies, and our hands, what we do, and the resources to do it. Mary was called and used by God because she had faith. God still calls those who have faith, and his favor rests on you.